This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for tuning in this week's NC Spin, show number 1020. We've had a most interesting week as the legislature revealed and passed a $23.9 billion budget, and we'll talk about the way they did it. The issue of transparency and accountability were the basis of a court hearing, and you'll be interested in hearing how the court ruled. We'll look at what's left in this legislative session, and you'll want to tune in to t hear what the panel tells us that we don't know. Joining us on this week's panel are former Lieutenant Governor Dennis Wicker, John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, Chris Fitzsimon, political analyst, and Leo Daughtry, former legislator and UNC board member. We begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages by our underwriters. Many of the 300,000 uninsured in our state are volunteer firefighters, farmers, fishermen, and small business owners. Let's create a North Carolina solution for covering the uninsured. To learn more, visit careforcarolina.com. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. Quality of life enjoyed by North Carolinians comes from the sacrifice of our state and local government retirees. These men and women risked their lives in times of danger. They taught our children, kept our neighborhoods clean, and protected the state's resources. They are North Carolina's silent heroes. The North Carolina Retired Governmental Employees Association proudly serves as the voice for more than 300,000 retirees across North Carolina. Our retirees deserve no less, and every day we stand by them. Let's do it. House Speaker Tim Moore told me this week that the budget passed by the legislature was approved the fastest of any year since the beginning of the short session. But the big news about this budget was not how fast, but how it was passed. Whether you were a D, an R, or a U, you have to admit the maneuver used to pass this budget was unprecedented legislative leaders in order to escape potential amendments or even debates crafted the budget behind closed doors, stripped the bill previously involving insurance, and inserted the budget as a conference report, meaning lawmakers could either vote for or against the budget, but couldn't do anything else. I want to ask John and Chris, both of you, some people say this was skullduggery and the worst example of government anybody's ever seen in North Carolina, while other people are saying it was a brilliant political strategy. Which side do you come down on, Chris? Well, I'd probably tend more toward the skullduggery side. Uh, I think, that in fact, this is, you know, I've been complaining. I complained when Democrats crafted the budget in secret. I complained when Republicans crafted the budget in secret. But we've never seen the budget crafted in secret and then uh, you, a parliamentary maneuver used to literally make it impossible for the vast majority of Republicans and Democrats to stand up and offer any changes to the bill, to, to debate the policy issues, and there were policy issues in there. I think this is unprecedented almost an assault on our democracy and what they're banking on is that people don't care about process but I think if you go to them and say your legislator had zero impact zero opportunity to debate how much teachers got paid what your taxes are what's going to happen to the roads in your area none of that was allowed by yeah, the I process said they that might they as well used. send the other well, that's right. 160 of them home <clears throat> brilliant political strategy or skullduggery John um, I, I don't think it was a brilliant political strategy I didn't like the budget process either I think some of the claims against it have been hyperbolic uh, it was not exactly the worst thing North Carolina has ever seen in government. We have former governors, former legislative leaders who went to prison for doing things. <laughs> I would argue that might be slightly worse. <laughs> I also wouldn't compare this to North Korea, as Mickey Michaud, the, the outgoing state representative from Durham, did. Mistake. But this was a problematic budget process. The Republicans argue that this was the second year of a two-year budget that did have debate last year. Yeah, that's sort of true. They also argue that... Sort of had debate. That, that Well, they did have debate last year, potential for right. amendments. The other thing they say is that it's not really unprecedented. 
and I do remember these days when you would have the House and Senate pass budgets, which were done in public, and then they would create a conference committee that would write a conference right, report right. that had a bunch of stuff that had never been debated, well, this, and you couldn't amend that. So that part of their argument is true, but they could have done a much better, more open job. But this than had they lots did. of new stuff in it, Leo, that they had never gone to the floor, had never been discussed or debated, and there was no chance to change, right? Well, Representative Lewis says, as John mentioned, that last year, the House had their budget, the Senate had their budget, they go in and they make a conference report, and instead of going through all that process, let's just cut to the chase and have a conference report. I think they did that. Jerry Cohen, who was uh, the legal eagle over at the legislature for more years than most of us can remember, uh, says that this is legal but unprecedented what they did. He said it's the first time since 1985 that uh, neither house has allowed any kind of amendments to be proposed. Uh, are we going to see a legal challenge here? Not sure you'll see a legal challenge. I don't know what basis they would have for a legal challenge for this time, but I, I will tell you that I, I, I still am trying to figure out why they did it because the majority in, uh, party in the legislature has the votes and they have a super majority, as a matter of fact, to do what they want to. I just don't know why they wouldn't take the time to go through the budget again, scrutinize it, give people a chance to debate it, offer amendments, and come out with well, a budget. Well, some say that they, they were just trying with. to put the Democrats in a box. Well, I don't know, but if you had the debate, and certainly there would be political craftsmanship around, and they would say something like, let's amend the bill to raise teacher salary from 6% to 8%, and you would vote that down or you would vote for it. But if you voted it down, then you would see a mailer in your mailbox that you v voted against the teacher's ra pay raise from 8%, from 6%. But Democrats to 8%. are still going to see well, that, aren't they? What, 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 this, is what, this is what the process, this is what democracy is about. You take votes, you get to propose things. When the Republicans are in the minority, they proposed all kinds of amendments, and then they ran ads, and they defeated some Democrats saying, guess what they voted against? This is what the whole debate is about. This is, I think this is really... A, a terrible precedent in North Carolina. It's it's not adjusting a budget. They spent a lot of new money. They changed policies. You know, well, let's they, get into some I, of that. I agree with that. You cannot <laughs> simply say, well, the, an amendment that fails might be used politically, so let's not have amendments. I agree with all that. But again, Republicans did have a bit of a point when they when they argued the Democrats could have filed Governor Cooper's budget as a bill. Except and when none of them the did. The budget was decided already. They had a press Why conference. Why didn't they file the it as a bill and make political right, hay let's of Let's get it. into some specifics on the budget because I, I want to make sure we talk about some of these things. The teachers got a six and a half percent average pay raise, and principals got a six point nine percent increase in pay. Uh, one that's pretty much baked into last year's budget, Dennis. I mean, weren't these pay raises pretty much uh, already assured? Yeah, I think they were, Tom. And so this isn't new money. No, no, this isn't necessarily new money. Uh, and, and I think that uh, the teachers will, will get a, a raise in various grades and, and ter terms of experience. But I, I think that uh, w what we got to keep in mind is that, that the debate should have still occurred as to the best policy. Now, I didn't like it as much as the governor proposal, but I like it. I think it was a good uh, hit for teachers to get that pay raise, and it's going to help our education system. Speaking of education, uh, Leo, uh, there was $18 million put in the budget to expand pre-K, uh, which is going to allow 3,500 more children to be able to, to, to go to pre-K. Uh, but there's still a waiting list. Now, the, the Republican leadership said that their goal was to eliminate that waiting list by 2021. Given the huge surplus that they have this year, there are a lot of people saying they should have used more of that surplus to just go ahead and wipe out that wait list now. What well, do you think? I think they're doing the right thing. They've got a plan, and I think they're following their plan. Uh, they may need that extra money. There's going to be a recession but one of these days. they spent it anyway, didn't they? No, I don't think so. I think they saved they spent, a lot of money. Well, okay, well, he, they put a lot of money in, in yeah. reserve, no question. Yeah, I want to make one point about child care. The Trump administration and Congress passed a bill to give North Carolina $70 million to expand child care. The legislature used a few million to expand child care, used the rest of the money to pay for child care we already had. So they didn't, the, the federal government told them, here's extra money. We, we think there's, there's 50,000 kids on a waiting list for affordable child care in North Carolina. We reduced it by a couple thousand kids and used the money for other stuff. So, so a lot of the things that they funded this year were literally using federal funds to supplant state money. Uh, still on the subject of education, community colleges got $14 million uh, for new programs and equipment for 
short-term uh, workforce uh, education, uh, particularly since their enrollments are down some. They've also gotten some money to be able to help boost up their enrollments and $24 million for faculty. Uh, Dennis, I know the community colleges have long been one of your sweet spots and, and one of your passions. Uh, does this help bring community colleges back up to parity a little bit closer? Well, it's a step forward, and I, I applaud the legislature and the leadership in the legislature for putting that in the budget. As you know, uh, workforce development is going to be one of the most important things we do in North Carolina in the next few years, and we need to invest now. And they got a new leader with Peter Hines who has, I think, some great ideas for taking us to uh, higher levels in workforce development. I'm glad the legislature funded it so he can get started. John, the, the university's got $9 million to uh, expand and build a database. The, mm -hmm. it, it, as it was, the, the university, the various campuses of the universities couldn't communicate and get data back and forth to each other. Uh, they also got a $20 million boost for university salaries, but they allowed the Board of Governors to establish the priorities for those increases rather than the administration. What do you think of that idea? I think the Board of Governors continues to argue that their role as govern in governance needs to be not just saying yes to whatever administration presents, but setting some broad parameters. I don't know that they have the balance right, and we have a member here. I don't know if we have the balance right between the administration and the Board of Governors as an appointed board governing the administration, but that's going to be an issue we're going to see play out well, over what do you think again. about this, Leo? Well, Let your million. fellow board members make the decisions on how to allocate these. That's, it's a funny thing. The twenty million dollars, most all state employees got two percent. Right. If you use the twenty million to give to university employees, you have 09 percent. So that money's got to be spread around on a merit type basis. And I don't think anybody's looking forward to doing that. It's well, going to be does very. Does the board of governors have the? Uh, pardon me, just a second. Does the board of governors really have the knowledge to be able to go up and handpick which professors I, at which I think, universities? Uh, President Spellings and her group will be involved but, in that. Well, that's the administration. That's not the board of governors. I understand, but they work for us. But that's what's so, been so interesting. Not, not many organizations. The board of any organization sets the, the compensation for the chief executive or the president. But the board, the boards normally don't go down and tell the president how to allocate salary money. This is another example, I think, of the university not trusting the administration. Dennis, I mean, let's talk about the, the. John mentioned the fact, or Leo mentioned the fact that the state, rank and file state employees got a two percent pay raise. I think the big news here was that the legislature, for the very first time in history, put a, a basement ceiling on what full-time state employees were going to earn. $31,200 is what they said, which equates to uh, at least $15 an hour. Um, that seemed to please a lot of state employees. Do you think that was a good move? Well, yeah. I mean, anything in the direction of increasing salaries for state employees at, at the bottom is a good move, and, and the legislature, again, I think, made a good move doing that. Remember about our prison guards, for example. Uh, yeah, it, it gave special raises to some segments. A absolutely, but, you know, that's going to make a difference in the quality of the workforce we have as prison guards in our prisons, which is very important. We've had multiple problems about all that. Hopefully this will be a step in trying to... Our highway patrol troopers. Highway patrol, yeah. law enforcement. So hopefully this will be a step in fixing that. John, it gave uh, $35 million for school safety uh, and student support personnel. Uh, at first blush with all the... What, what, you got a thousand some schools across North Carolina? No, more than that across North Carolina. Seems like a drop in the bucket. What do you think? Well, I don't think it's a drop in the bucket, but it's also not a full bucket. Okay. Uh, it's somewhere in between. I, I, I think that I understand they're going to be continuing to work on that issue. They had a panel look at it. They funded some of the initial proposals from the panel, and it's going to continue. Uh, school safety has a lot. It's a multifaceted issue. You've got to approach it in different directions, and I don't mind them doing it in stages. What do you think about this idea that's been put forth in the legislature, by the way, about giving teachers an additional pay increase if they will take the training to become school support personnel? Well, uh, I don't think it's a good idea, and we need to have... It hasn't passed. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea, and I don't think we need teachers bringing guns to schools. I don't think we need uh, teachers being support personnel. We need actual support personnel. I do want to jump in one second on the state employees. We're now in a big economic upturn. We still are. We have a giant surplus in North Carolina. We have a big rainy day fund, and we're all applauding state employees are getting 2%. So this, apparently, with the current regime, is the maximum unbelievable pay raise we're going to give state workers is 2%. 
I think that if but that, it is that, permanent. But, but, but still, I'm yeah. just saying that's the that's what we're all celebrating. Think about that for a second. How underpaid state employees are and have been. If they're not going to get a bigger raise when we're flush with money, what's going to happen to them when we're not flush with money? Good question. Very good question. And you, and your point is well taken as far as it goes. Uh, Leo, one other thing that they did was they expanded uh, and loosened the ability for tax breaks uh, and the amount of money that could be made available. Uh, to these these big fish kinds of industries who uh, potentially could come into North Carolina. We, we right now know that Amazon's HQ2 is still in play and Apple's new research campus, we understand, is pretty close to finalization. Um, what do you think about these economic incentives and tax breaks they're giving to all these big companies? Well, we've, we've been trying to give tax breaks to big companies and we've not been very successful. We lost out in the car race when uh, Toyota did not come here. Uh, we've never been very fortunate when we hunt for what we call buffalo. And I just think we continue to uh, give these incentives and I think we'll, we'll continue to do that as long as these companies well, are looking at us. We actually make noise about giving these incentives, but when it comes to these big companies, we don't actually give any of them because we don't land any we of them. We don't land any of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, but the problem is, None of us at this table like incentives. Uh, nobody likes giving tax dollars to companies to woo them to come to North Carolina. We think we have a great state and they ought to come anyway. The problem is we're having to compete with other states who do offer them. Now we can stick our head in the sand and not do anything about incentives and we'll lose every time. But if we're going to be in the game, we have to offer them. But if Billy jumps over the cliff, does that mean you've got to, too? I it's mean, not that's... a matter of jumping over the cliff. It's a matter of getting jobs to North Carolina. John, uh, let's talk about $10 million Senator Harry Brown put in the budget, uh, along with Dean Arp. Last week on the show, we talked about rural uh, issues in mm -hmm. North Carolina, particularly rural broadband. This is a $10 million grant program, which he admits it is not enough. It is just a drop in the bucket. But how significant do you think this is in helping to extend last mile broadband internet to rural Well, it's North obviously Carolina? a significant development, but not the end of the story. Remember that years ago when, when the legislature intervened, they were trying to prevent cities from going into business against private business competing in the same market. So this is more cooperative approach, looking literally at cooperatives and others uh, trying to come in and not muscle aside private industry, but figure out a solution. But this bill, this money allowed the local governments to go into that business and yeah. fund those businesses, but, but then they had to lease it back to the private right. sector. Right. In this case, it will not be the government-funded competition for a private industry. That was the objection before. All right. Well, we started this discussion with the procedure used to pass the state budget. Some believe lack transparency and accountability, but it isn't the first entrance, instance where our legislature has been accused of such action. In 2016, lawmakers were called into special session to allocate money for Hurricane Matthew. When they completed that task, they adjourned, then called another special session that essentially shifted power away from the governor to the legislature itself. Common Cause and other organizations sued, saying this violated the constitutional right for the people to inform their legislators. But this past week, a three-judge panel ruled that the special session was indeed legal. Dennis, in ruling that this special session was constitutional, judges said the times in which we now live greatly reduced those problems encountered long ago with electronic access and notices and news reporting on an hourly or even real-time basis, if you're remotely interested in what's going on in Raleigh, it is as available as the time or weather forecast on your device. Tell us if you agree or disagree with that. Uh, I don't think I d agree with that. Uh, I, I read through the case quickly, <coughs> I'll admit that, and I'm, I just, there was not a precedent that I could see or find that they based it on, but it seemed to be cred predicated, as you just mentioned and just read, on technology. Well, as we know, about 10% of our po population in this state doesn't even have access to the Internet. So how do they have access to their representative if they don't have the Internet? I, I will tell you it, it, what's ironic. North Carolina law by the legislature requires a 10-day notice for local governments to change any ordinance. Ten days. And they do this in two hours in the legislature. I find that very much ironic. L Leo, you're the other lawyer on our panel here. Uh, uh, and 
what I understand the court said here was not that they approve of what the legislature did in those special sessions, but their right to be able to and, do it. Is that correct? And that that's correct, and that it was, in fact, constitutional, what they did. So what's the long-term implication from this, John? Anything? Well, there are certain kinds of provisions, and I understand Dennis's uh, passion about this issue, but there are certain kinds of provisions of constitutions that unless you could find a very clear standard to apply in a case, it's just difficult to enforce through litigation. We've seen them in other areas, and this may be another example of that. All right, so the budget is passed. Lawmakers have set their sights on adjournment now, and we want our panel to talk about uh, what's left for them to do before they can go home, because we hear they're going home before July 1st. Uh, Leo, last year, uh, the, the, the legislature indicated they would be changing judicial and prosecutorial districts, even going so far as to postponing the judicial primary elections. Well, we're almost here. What are they supposed to be held in the filing period in two weeks or three weeks or something like that? Is redistricting coming? Well, they're up against the wall. I understand they have a meeting of the elections committee on Monday at 4 o'clock, and I assume they're going to take up uh, judicial and prosecutorial uh, redistricting. But at the same time, they got a drop dead date of Ju June 18th. And you've got Father's Day in that, plus you've got the other things that go along in life, and I don't see how they can do it, frankly. Well, I, th there's still a lot of noise about it. I think in, they got some, uh, I think Mecklenburg County and, and Guilford County may be involved, but I don't think they can do the whole thing. Yeah, state. there is some movement on legislation for that. Uh, any other uh, right off, I want to get to constitutional amendments and perhaps uh, bond issues, but any other legislation that you think uh, has a good chance of passing licensing reform for uh, professionals, uh, certificate of need reforms, uh, whatever, anything else that anybody thinks is? I think uh, once the budget uh, has been passed as it has been, it's at the governor's desk. Uh, yeah, and that, that raises a question, by the way. Is he going to veto this? I, mean, I don't see any merit in him vetoing this, yeah. uh, quite frankly. I mean, they got the supermajority in the legislature. They'll override it, but he may do it on principle. Who knows? I, I think that there may be other things coming down the pike the governor's interested in. And so ah, I think this is related. I think that the question about whether he vetoes or allows, allows it to go without his signature, go in place without his signature, probably has a lot to do with those subsequent Chris, we matters. hear there are going to be some constitutional amendments uh, mm -hmm. uh, considered uh, before they get out. Uh, one of them is another attempt at voter ID, which, of course, the courts right. have ruled uh, was unconstitutional, although the, the Texas version passed the courts. Um, some of the other ones that I'm hearing about is capping the income tax rate at 5.5%. Right. right to hunt and fish. Uh, limited state spending, uh, yeah, for the annual growth of inflation, right to hunt and fish. Uh, uh, condemnation of private property must be for public use. Uh, Marcy's Law, giving compensation to crime victims, uh, and electing the State Board of Ed. Which ones of these do you think well, might, I think the, might uh, pass? I think the right to hunt and fish might. I think the, uh, the lim I don't hope they don't put the uh, limiting uh, our tax rates on the, con on the ballot as a constitutional amendment. I think they might, and that will supersede the one I think about spending limits, is the so-called Tabor Law. I don't think that will be on the ballot. Another thing that I'm hearing, uh, Dennis, is there may be some bond issues uh, put before the legislature. There's a $3 billion transportation bond being discussed. The, the big brouhaha now is over whether this is going to be voted for by the public or non-voted for. And Treasurer Dale Falwell says if it's, non, if it's non-voted, if the legislature passes it and the public doesn't vote for it, he'll oppose it. Well, uh, I, I'm in his camp on that, quite frankly. I think uh, anytime you have a bond that size, the people should vote on it, and uh, so hopefully the legislature will see the wisdom of doing it that way, and they can make their case to the people. I agree. All right, uh, so uh, let's get to the point uh, where viewers tune in. Our audience numbers go up in this time of the show. <laughs> Tell us something we don't know, John Hood. Tom, we only <clears throat> mention it briefly, but I think the biggest headline, or one of the biggest headlines from the budget is the additional savings put into reserves. And it's important to remember the rainy day fund is only one of a number of reserves that we have. So if we add it all together, rainy day, disaster relief, Medicaid reserves, unencumbered fund balance, we've got $3.3 billion in reserves of some kind or the other. That's about 14% of the general fund. That's Pretty a healthy place to be. It's up to some money, isn't it? Dennis Wicker, tell us something we don't know. Uh, Tom, we have a sobering demographic that's approaching us very soon. In 2030, we're going to have 
20% of our labor force that is highly skilled that's not that's going to be retired, and that's going to have a tremendous impact on our economy and our health care system in North Carolina. And this is a subject, by the way, that's not being discussed very much, but it's a very real issue in our state. Very, I agree. Thank you for raising it. Leo Daltrey, tell us something we don't know. There is a provision in the budget that has to do with the judiciary, uh, 17A and 17B. I think that includes Surrey and Stokes County, and I forgot the other two. Are, are losing their superior court judge, and the uh, 19A is getting the superior court judge, and that's another couple counties. Wow. I mean, it, uh, all of this is just confusing as heck, isn't it? It's very confusing to know why or what they're doing about it. You almost have to have a scorecard to know who your judge is going to be. Uh, Chris Fitzsimon, tell us something we don't know. Not too many years ago, just before the Republicans took over, one of the big objections they had to the Democratic budget was that it funded nonprofits with government money. There's roughly $35 million in the budget to do that. One specific thing I want to point out, that we've been giving money to religious organizations for a while to do feed the poor and do these things. This time in the budget, they're giving money to a religious organization whose mission literally is to convert people to Christianity. I think they'll be, the ACLU or somebody will file a lawsuit about and one then of those there's the anti-abortion funds right. to some of this pork barrel money. Well, folks, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback and read my weekly column. Be sure to visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook and join us next week when we'll have more balanced debate for the old North State. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Many of the 300,000 uninsured in our state are volunteer firefighters, farmers, fishermen, and small business owners. Let's create a North Carolina solution for covering the uninsured. To learn more, visit careforcarolina.com. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. The quality of life enjoyed by North Carolinians comes from the sacrifice of our state and local government retirees. These men and women risked their lives in times of danger. They taught our children, kept our neighborhoods clean, and protected the state's resources. They are North Carolina's silent heroes. The North Carolina Retired Governmental Employees Association proudly serves as the voice for more than 300,000 retirees across North Carolina. Our retirees deserve no less, and every day we stand by them. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.